Hi there, here's my second video of determining intervals of increase and decrease. In this video, the derivatives are going to be not really any harder. We do have another chain rule coming up, but solving them is going to be a little bit more difficult. Solving this first one is going to require synthetic division, and the second one is going to have some radicals and lots of good old fun in it, some common factors and the like. So let's get started with the first. If you wanted uh, to learn about intervals of increase and decrease, you may want to look at my part one video, not part two, because I'm going to jump right in here. Okay, so if you recall, step one in a function is determining the derivative, and the derivative for this function is quite easy. For g prime of x, you're going to get 12x cubed, then you get minus 48x squared, here you get 12x, and then 72. The derivative of 8 is 0, so we don't need to write it. So derivative was easy to determine. Then we're going to set that equal to 0. And so before I do that, I guess I'll get rid of a common factor that's a little bit large in here. It looks like there are a number of, I made a mistake already, look at that, 16 should be 12x. Now we have a common factor of 12 that kicks out of there. So we take a 12 out and you get x cubed minus 4x squared plus x, now that I changed 16 to 12, and you get uh, 6 left over. And we want to set that equal to 0, so we don't need to factor out the 12. You divide 0 by 12, it's gone. And so my derivative would be written as 12 onto that, and you're setting it equal to 0. But we need to factor this out. So trying to factor that equation down into terms is going to require synthetic division or polynomial division, which is another video to learn, teach you about. But uh, I'm just going to jump in like you've seen synthetic division before. The first step we have to do is find one of the factors of 6 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 plus or minus 3 plus or minus 6, find one of those that makes this equal to 0. So if we try negative 1, for example, negative 1 cubed is going to be a minus 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. Then uh, plugging that in, you'd get a minus 4. Then negative 1 and plus 6. So by plugging in x equals negative 1, you do have a function that adds up to give 0. So x equals negative 1 is a root. That means x plus 1 equals 0 is a factor. Okay, so what we learned with synthetic division is you take this negative 1 as one of the roots, and you write a division symbol, and you write the coefficients, a 1, a negative 4, a positive 1, and a 6, you write under here. So 1, negative 4, positive 1, and a 6. So what we do is we would drop the 1 down. Then you would take this number, multiply it by that, and write it in that spot. So negative 1. You add those up, and you get negative 5. Follow the same step, multiply by what's there. Negative 1 times negative 5 gives positive 5. Write it in that spot, add them up, you get 6. Negative 1 times 6, negative 6, add them up, and this is your remainder. You want that to always equal 0, and it does in this case. So if that equals 0, then these are the coefficients of the factored term. That means that 1x squared minus 5x plus 6 is one factor, and the other factor is x plus 1. So we've turned this thing, x cubed minus 4x squared plus x plus 6 is equivalent to that. So now that you've said it, since they're equivalent, this is also g prime. It is 12 times that stuff. Setting it equal to 0. Again, the 12 was gone. We don't care about it. Now you've got something that you can factor and solve equal to 0. 
except here we can factor that down even further. What two numbers multiply to give 6, add to give negative 5? I think negative 3 and negative 2 are the choices you would use. So my x plus 1 is still here. And the x squared minus 5x plus 6 becomes x minus 3 and x minus 2. Setting that equal to 0, you've got three solutions. Negative 1, positive 3, and positive 2 are the roots of this equation. Looking at a number line to help visualize the intervals, you would have negative 1, positive 2, and positive 3. So my intervals are going to be all x less than negative 1, all x is between negative 1 and 2, x is between 2 and 3, and x is greater than 3. These are four intervals that I will test values in. I'll create the data table or an interval table that has those intervals in them x smaller than negative 1, between negative 1 and 2, between 2 and 3, and all x greater than 3. That's my intervals. What are my factors? My factors are x plus 1, x minus 3, x minus 2, and I create a column for the actual derivative g prime of x. Alrighty, so we'll fill that in with some lines, make it look pretty, pretty as it gets for freehand drawing. Alright, so choose any number less than negative 1, like negative 2 for example, and put that into each column. Negative 2 plus 1 is a negative, negative 2 minus 3 is a negative, negative 2 minus 2 is a negative, three negatives when multiplied together is a negative, that's where your function is decreasing. Alrighty, so we choose a number between negative 1 and 2, I would choose 0. This function will be positive here, it will be negative there, and negative when you plug in zeros, two negatives make a plus. Function is increasing. Next one to look at, between 2 and 3, uh, I would choose 2 and a half or 5 over 2. So using 2 and a half plus 1, so this is a positive. 2 and a half minus 3 is negative. 2 and a half minus 2 is positive. Two positives in the negative makes a negative. That's where the function's decreasing. The last one's probably going to be increasing, but it's worth checking. Plug in 4, that's a number bigger than 3. 4 plus 1 is positive. 4 minus 3, positive. 4 minus 2, positive. They're all positive. The whole thing is increasing. Okay, so the barrier to this question was likely not the concept. It was likely factoring that down to these three factors. That's probably the hard part uh, for you. All right, so one where the derivative gets tougher. We'll look at g, where you have a function of x onto the square root of 4 minus x, we have to treat this like a product rule, where this function is f and that function is g. The product rule says if you have the product of two terms, you do f prime g plus f g prime. The derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first, and you add those up. So to find my derivative, we'll call it dy by dx or y prime, doesn't matter. So we do f prime first, which is just 1, times g, which is the original function, square root of 4 minus x, uh, plus the derivative of f, which is just x, times the derivative of g prime, and here's where we have to be careful. Square root of 4 minus x is really 4 minus x to the 1 half power. And I'm going to do chain rule on that, bring the one-half down, you get one-half, the bracket four minus x is to the negative one-half, because you reduce the power, then take the derivative of what's inside, the derivative of four minus x is negative one. All of those terms are multiplied together. So for my derivative then, <clears throat> dy by dx, I have 
4 minus x to the 1 half. I'll write it that way for reasons that will become clear in a moment. I will take the negative 1 and the 1 half and the x and write it as negative x over 2 or 1 half x. And then my bracket of 4 minus x to the minus 1 half is sitting there. So it looks like there is a 4 minus x to the minus 1 half as a common factor. This step that I'm about to take students often struggle with. So we'll just take a break for a minute and I'll remind you of what happens if you had x cubed minus x and you wanted x to the 1 and you wanted to take a common factor out. You recognize the common factor is x and you take it out. Everybody writes x on x squared minus 1. But they, if you don't really think about what happened there, then this, the step we're trying with the half powers is difficult. So what you did is you took x to the 1 out. Where did this 2 come from? It was because you took 3, subtract 1, makes 2. You took 1, subtract 1, which makes x to the 0, and x to the 0 is 1. So that's why those terms sit that way. You take the smallest power of x out by subtracting that exponent from everything there. You took the smallest power of x out, subtracted from 3 and got 2, subtracted from 1 and got 0. I'm going to follow that same method with these really ugly 4 minus x to the minus 1 halves. This is my smallest power. I will remove like a common factor. So dy by dx, I'm going to take out 4 minus x to the minus 1 half power out as a common factor. If I do that from this term, I subtract four, I subtract the negative one half from the one half that's there. And if you subtract one half minus minus a half makes one, it makes two over two. So that leaves four minus x to the one power in the first term. Then minus x over 2, and you took this bracket out, so it is gone. So when, by taking that out as a common factor, that step we just did is the trickiest part of this question. But it's no more difficult than what we did here with the x's that aren't fractions. You took the smallest power out and subtracted it. When you happen to subtract a negative half from a half, you get 1. Because one half minus a minus a half is a half plus a half, which makes two over two, which makes one. Okay, so this part here, a negative exponent is in the denominator. So I'm going to rewrite that and make a fraction. So my dy by dx is just the numerator is going to be changed, but my denominator is square root of four minus x. Negative means move it downstairs. One half means make it a root. And up top, I have 4 minus x, then minus x over 2. Common denominator says that that's 2 over 2. So minus 2 over 2, then minus 1 over 2, I get 4 minus 3x over 2 in the numerator. All of that just to get this derivative to find out where is the derivative equal to 0? We can set this equal to 0. Bring that up. It does not make it equal to 0. So the only way a function is equal to 0 is by looking at the numerator. So we set 4 minus 3x over 2 equal to 0. Take the 3x over 2 to the other side. 4 equals 3x over 2. Next step, multiply both sides by 2, 8 equals 3x, x equals 8 over 3. There's one of the critical points. It does behoove us to check this point here that makes the denominator undefined. So you could plug in also x equals 4 and check that as well if you'd like. Uh, and so you've got some points to check. You check left of 8 thirds, so less than. 8 over 3 and greater than 8 over 3 and don't be shy to check 4 if you wanted to check between negative 8 over 3 and 4. It's not going to change anything in this function. So my uh, 
interval x less than 8 thirds or x greater than 8 thirds. What am I testing? 4 minus 3x over 2. And the denominator, but that's always a positive that you're, that you're putting in there. And uh, so no, you can put it in. doesn't hurt. And your derivative, dy by dx. Okay, so let's choose any number less than 8 over 3. Okay, so choosing a number less than 8 over 3, like 0, you would get 4 minus 3, 0 over 2. This is positive. If you get 4 minus 0, that's positive. Looks like it's increasing there. Choose a number bigger than 8 over 3, like 9 over 3, which is just 3. Plug 3 in and you get 4 minus 9 over 2, 4 minus 9 over 2, 9 over 2 is 4 and a half, so that is a negative in that interval. You have 4 minus 3 is 1, square root of that is positive, and you get a negative and a positive, it's decreasing there. However, some students at this point choose a really big number bigger than 8 over 3, they choose a number like 5. If you chose a number like 5, you weren't thinking of your function very well when you were looking at this because when you plug in 5, no problem here, you get a negative. When you plug in 5 there, you get 4 minus 5 is negative 1 and you can't take the square root of negative 1. So you've got a domain issue here. The square root of that number has to always be positive. So in part of your domain, you've got to start thinking that your 4 minus x always has to be bigger than 0. So you were only dealing with uh, x's that were less than 4, right? So you shouldn't choose any number bigger than 4 anyway because it makes the uh, function undefined. So our interval of increase was x less than 8 thirds. That's where the function's increasing. Where is it decreasing? It's decreasing on all x larger than 8 over 3. At 8 over 3 is where it was actually equal to 0. All right, so there's two other questions that were much more difficult to solve. And uh, hopefully you really got your head wrapped around this interval of increase and decrease stuff. The next set of videos that I plan to make are applying this to max min questions and to find the critical points and the max and min points. Basically everything you need is right here. So the next video of maximum and minima is just one step uh, further than what you've seen. Good luck.